Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Sorry about the configuration of this room. I wasn't, I'm never quite sure why it was designed the way it was designed, but we're stuck with this room. So um, welcome to everybody. It's a great pleasure to welcome uh, my friend Robert Kaplan to the Kennedy School. He really doesn't need a lengthy introduction. I think most of you have probably Googled him already or know about him. But he is the national correspondent for Atlantic Magazine. He's a senior fellow at the Center uh, for a New American Security, which is a great new think tank in Washington, D.C. And I think he has the best job of anybody I know. For people who are interested in the world and the future of the world and contemporary international policy, what better job than to be paid to write really brilliant books about cutting edge issues? And that's what he's done for the last 25 or 30 years. Um, he's written 12 books. 12, 13. 13. <laughs> 13 books. 13. Yeah. Um, a lot of people uh, of a certain age will remember Balkan Ghosts, which at a critical time in the early 1990s, when the United States and Europe had to figure out how to stop a war, this book was a, a framework for how to understand, at least, the conflict in, in Bosnia and Herzegovina and with the breakup of Yugoslavia at that time. He has written many, many articles on the rising powers of the world, a lead article in Foreign Affairs on China, articles on India. And he has recently, just in the last um, two weeks, published a book called Monsoon, uh, The Future of American Power in the Indian Ocean, which looks at the intersection of competing interests of a lot of different countries, the United States, India, Japan, China, in the Indian Ocean, but really is an in-depth look into the sociology politics, history of the peoples of the Indian Ocean region. Um, Megan, Professor Sullivan, and I had a chance to listen to Bob in Colorado at Aspen in the summer. And one way I think about uh, Bob's thesis, and he'll be talking to you about this, is that I think I'm stealing this line from you appropriately. Yeah. If the Mediterranean was the focal point of global politics in the 20th century, we might think of the Indian Ocean as the focal point of global politics and opportunity in the 21st. He'll talk to you about this. Um, and I hope after his 25, 30 minute presentation, please we have seats right here, um, you'll have a chance to ask him questions about this. Before we get started, excuse me, we have a chair right here. <laughs> I'm right over. Um, before we get started, I wanted to introduce not only Professor Megan O'Sullivan, who is here, um, but also our new fellow here at the Kennedy School, Ambassador Syed Jawad, who for nine years had been Afghanistan's ambassador to the United States until his retirement from the um, government of Afghanistan in September of this year. He's on his very first day as our newest fellow for the Fisher Fellows Program for our program on um, the future of, of India in South Asia here at the Kennedy School. He's here at the invitation of Professor O'Sullivan and myself. He will certainly be speaking, I think, in both of our classes. He'll be giving a speech on the future of Afghanistan, on the reconciliation issue. We'll schedule that sometime in the next two or three weeks. So I want to uh, welcome Ambassador Jawad Thank you very much. Uh, to the Kennedy School. Um, Bob, the floor is yours. All right. Take as much time as you'd like to sure. speak. Sure, yeah. And then we'll be happy to ask you questions. All right. Thank, th thank you very much, Nick. And I'll talk for about 25 minutes or so. Uh, due to the configuration of this room, I'm going to be rude and, uh, and fit, you know, give my backside to a uh, unfortunate. Sherry and Rob, why don't you uh, sit in this uh, side? At least you can look at uh, um, To a number of things. Um, it's, it's a real pleasure and privilege to be here today. And why don't I start with this? That the sum total effect of the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan whatever you think about the wars, the sum total effect will ultimately be to fast forward the arrival of the Asian century. Not just in economic terms, because that's been going on since the late 1970s, with the rise of the Pacific Rim, the Pacific Tigers, Ford and Forbes and Fortune magazine were writing about Asia's economic rise, I remember, 25, 30 years ago almost. But I mean the rise of the Asian century in military terms as well, which has gotten a lot less coverage of late. Um, when we thought of Asian armies 
in the early Cold War days, the, the land forces of India in 1960, the land forces of China in, 19, uh, in 1960, we thought of more or less oxen-cow armies that were um, central to the effort of nation building, of national co consolidation. Um, and who were focused inward, um, you know, building roads, bringing in the crop. We did, they weren't focused outward towards other armies. But as the Cold War evolved, and you had several decades worth of economic growth in Asia, um, and it's this is you know this sounds like a contradiction, but it's actually true that things like ballistic missiles and atomic weapons are often the products not of totalitarian states, but of li prosperous liberal economic societies. It's, do it's domestic prosperity that goes on for many decades that leads to, to the burgeoning of military technology. And nobody has written about this more perceptively than I know than Professor Paul Bracken at Yale University in his book, The uh, uh, in his book, Fire in the East, The Rise of the Asia, the Rise of Asia, which is 12 years old, but it was an enormously prescient book. And so you had it, Asian armies evolve. And it wasn't just China, and it wasn't just India. It was the modernization of the Japanese self-defense forces, of the, of the South Korean military. Uh, the last 10 years, Southeast Asian countries have increased their military spending by 30% which is enormous. Um, and you've had, you know, so rather than oxen cow land forces, you've had the gradual emergence of real civilian military post-industrial complexes, complete with missiles, in some cases atomic weapons, weapons of mass destruction, uh, very sophisticated air and naval forces with the latest Aegis navigation and, and weapon systems. Um, the Japanese Navy now, this is, you know, a, a so-called quasi-pacifistic country with, um, that only gives one or one and a half percent of its GDP to, to the defense, now has 123 of the most modern warships. That's four times the size of the British Royal Navy, and that's before the British defense cuts were announced a few days ago. So, and, you know, and this is Japan. Um, China is going to have probably more submarines, the latest diesel, electric, and nuclear-powered submarines at sea than the United States in the next 15 years. India is going from about the fifth or sixth largest navy to about the third or fourth largest navy over the next few years. Um, you know, India, and we'll get to this later, really looks out at the Indian Ocean in a Monroe Doctrine style way, in the same way that China looks out at the South China Sea. Um, um, in other words, these, these militaries are now focused outwards at each other. Uh, military power is, is moving, so to speak, from Europe. Um, to Asia, when you look at, it's not just the cuts in European defense budgets, it's also the fact that it's harder and harder for European militaries to be expeditionary, to move for forces to areas, whereas Asian countries are putting a lot of, you know, a lot of resources into this. And um, the, the U.S. military is ahead of the curve on this. It's, it's gotten, it's, it's ahead of the media in this sense. In the October 2007 Maritime Strategy Doctrine that was issued by the Coast Guard and the U.S. Navy, the Navy said we're going to continue to be a two-ocean Navy, but no more the Atlantic and the Pacific. Those days are gone. It's going to be the Indian Ocean and the Pacific. And this is the U.S. Navy three years ago. The, the U.S. Marine Corps, in its vision statement of June 2008, said we're no longer going to be an Atlantic Pacific Maritime Marine Corps, we're going to be an Indian Ocean Pacific Marine Corps, because that's where the, the, you know, that's where the economic power is going and that's where military activity is going. And by military activity, I don't necessarily mean fighting wars. I mean all the things that navies and air forces do. 
humanitarian relief, protecting the sea lines of communication and other things. Um, and we really are entering a more maritime world. The last 10 years, the, U the U.S. public, the U.S. media has been obsessed, rightly so, with messy, dirty land wars, with discussions of counterinsurgency and this and that. Uh, what I'm positing here is that in military terms, we're entering, we're going to be entering a maritime age. Um, you know, the geography of Asia is essentially maritime. The geography of Europe in the 20th century was essentially land. We had huge you know, having a navy bottling the, uh, the Soviets up near the polar ice cap in the North Atlantic was not enough to stabilize uh, how, you know, for balance of power purposes in the Cold War. We needed, the U.S. rather, uh, needed vast numbers of ground troops in the heart of Europe. Asia has a different geography. Now, um, let's talk a bit about the Indian Ocean because the Pacific is more well known. It's more well known to Americans because Americans are prisoners of the Mercator projection. Uh, and the American kind of variation of the Mercator projection, which essentially puts North and South America in the middle of the map, and the Indian and Pacific Oceans are spread out at the edges, divided up. Um, America is an Atlantic Pacific country. Uh, the Soviet Union was a, you know, was a somewhat Pacific, somewhat Arctic Ocean, you know, North Atlantic country. The, Indi you know, uh, the Indian Ocean is the only one of the great oceans that doesn't have a superpower along its borders. And there's something more unique about the Indian Ocean that I want to focus on. It's the only ocean that has monsoon winds. This is enormously important for understanding the <coughs> culture of the region. Um, monsoon winds are reversible winds. Every six months, more or less like clockwork, by, uh, you know, the winds shift by 180 degrees. And what's more important is they're predictable. And because they're predictable, sailing distances can be calculated fairly accurately which means that the Indian Ocean did not have to wait for the age of steam to unite it. Um, before the age of steamboats, you had a unified, small and intimate ocean, even as it spanned several thousand miles. That's why you have a large Malay and ethnic Indonesian communities in Madagascar, four or five thousand miles across. It's why you have Yemeni communities from the Hadramut in northeastern Yemen, a large Yemeni communities in Indonesia on the other side of the ocean. It's why you find Gujaratis from northwestern India everywhere in the Indian Ocean, particularly on the east coast of Africa. Um, it's, um, you know, it did not have to wait for steamships to unite it. Um, and, you know, and, and, and this is really, uh, this is really key. And the, another thing about that is that we have all been, at least Americans, have been prisoners for too long of Cold War area studies. Um, at the end of the, of the World War II, the United States found itself a global power with global responsibilities which required area experts from different parts of the world. So the world was divided up into the Middle East, Central Asia, South Asia, Southeast Asia. First it was the Pacific Rim. Then it was called East Asia. And these were all useful terms to, you know, for university departments, for think tanks, for others. Um, what I'm trying to say is that the Indian Ocean shows us another world, a unified world that puts the Middle East and China together, so to speak. A sort of a, a, you know, a unified, gradual, organic continuum that goes all the way from the Horn of Africa around the southern navigable rimland of Eurasia through the Strait of Malacca all the way up to the Sea of Japan. And this is going to become more united because sometime in the 21st century we're liable to see canal and land bridge projects across the Isthmus of Kra in Thailand, across the Malay Peninsula, Dubai Ports World, People in China, Japan have done feasibility studies on this, so that ships will have more than just the Strait of Malacca.
as a way, to, a way to get from the Bay of Bengal to the South China Sea, from the Indian Ocean to the, you know, uh, um, to the Western Pacific. And, um, and so it was, it's, been a, it's been a united world, so to speak, the Southern Eurasian Rimland since antiquity. You have, you know, Roman coins up the Hooghly River in Calcutta. Uh, the ancient Romans were there. And when Vasco da Gama sailed to India, he didn't discover India. All he did was reacquaint Europeans with the wind system that got him to India. And he actually crossed from East Africa, what is now Kenya, to the west coast of India, I think it was in 21 days which is an enormously fast speed because they had caught the monsoons right because you know they had dis rediscovered the secrets of the winds thanks to Arab navigators. And in the east coast of China, you have not just one or two, but quite a few Persian and Arab mosques from the 8th century. Uh, you had Chinese navigators going to Yemen in the early 15th century. You had, in other words, this was a, a culturally united world. And what I'm saying is it's a useful way to think about this world in the 21st century as, as, as distances collapse due to technology, trade, um, uh, you know, faster ocean-going vessels, and, and other things. And one of the reasons why I'm concentrating so much on maritime perspective is because even in a jet and information age, we shouldn't forget that 90% of all commercial goods travel by sea because it's the cheapest way. Uh, globalization happens because of containers. Um, you know, the clothes on our back, the appliances we buy, likely came to us through container shipping. And if there's anyone responsible for protecting globalization, I would say it's the U.S. Navy. Because the U.S. Navy protects the sea lines of communications. Uh, navies do more than war fighting. They historically protected commerce. Um, it's very interesting to hear the ads, the recruitment ads for the U.S. Navy lately. Join the Navy, a global force for good. Nothing about winning America's wars, you know, a global force for good. It's, it's not an accident, it's deliberate, it's a different perspective. Um, and so we're going back to this classical super region. And from a, a power perspective, let me put it this way. Uh, China, think of China as trying to move south or vertically towards the Indian Ocean and India trying to move horizontally or east or west along the Indian Ocean. Um, China is um, constructing massive port projects, which I visited in the course of research for this book, at Gwadar in Pakistan, at Chittagong in Bangladesh, at Kayukfru in Burma, and especially at Hambantota on the southern tip of Sri Lanka. Um, it's interesting what China is doing. Um, there's a lot of debate about this. Um, I've come down after visiting the ports and a lot of reading and interviewing people that China really has no intention to have naval bases here because that would be too provocative to India. Um, and China is beside itself to convince people that its rise is benevolent and non-hegemonic. Um, also, it couldn't militarily protect these bases um, from the Indian Air Force and the Indian Navy. Uh, Gwadar is sort of un it's, it, Gwadar is an amazing sight to see, but it's basically un indefensible for, um, um, uh, uh, for military terms. No, I think what China is doing is it's building these bases, which are real state-of-the-art container ports. It's giving enormous amounts of military and economic aid to all of these countries where it's also building these bases. I, I think its intention is to have warehousing facility, kind of throughput facility for its consumer goods that China will be selling to the Middle East and to East Africa, and also visitation rights for its naval vessels at these ports. And if it, um, 
and if it plays its its diplomacy well um, and its economic aid well, it will be able to use these ports at will. Because one thing I see in the 21st century is we're good, we're moving away from these kind of big Burger King Cold War style bases where. The U.S., for instance, has its troops, its families, its dogs, its large supermarkets all on, you know, on foreign soil. And with such a large number of troops, the base itself becomes a political football for feisty local media. So that even though, China, even though that Japan feels more threatened by China, and more insecure by China's rise, the Japanese public is still increasingly uncomfortable with U.S. bases in Japan. Um, the same with the Korean public. One reason why U.S.-Korean relations are as good as they are is because we've, we've, we've reduced the troop presence there from about 37,000 troops to 25,000 troops, and we've moved troops out of downtown Seoul. So even though South Korea is ex increasingly nervous about rising Chinese naval and other forms of military power, there's this feeling of local pride nationalism that it doesn't want large bases there. And I think the Chinese will discover the same thing. And that's why I don't believe that China is going to have permanent bases in any of these places. But it, it, it is developing a sort of 21st century form of coaling stations along the Indian Ocean. Because where is China getting more and more uh, and, and such a large proportion of its energy from? It's, 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 nat it's oil, it's natural gas from the Middle East, from the Iranian plateau, from the, from the Arabian Peninsula. And most of that, those hydrocarbons travel by sea across the Indian Ocean, through the Strait of Malacca, up to China. And China wants a presence all along this area. After all, why would it always want to have its, its sea lines of communication dependent on the protection of the U.S. Navy? If you looked at China's history of being not just a great empire, where under the Tang Dynasty, um, China had a presence all the way up to northeastern Iran and Khorasan, um, but yet suffered tremendous territorial depredations in the 19th and early 20th centuries by the European powers, the United States, Russia, and Japan. So that China is trying to move south and at the same time uh, develop, um, develop a great navy, which I'll talk about in a few minutes. India is moving east and west in this sense. Um, what's interesting is to meet people, you know, to meet Indian intellectuals and thinkers and hear more talk than in the past about Lord George Nathaniel Curzon, who was the um, Viceroy of India from 1899 to 1905. And Curzon may have been a British imperialist, but he looked out at the world from the same geographical perspective as, the, as Indian prime ministers and elites do today. He's, you know, Curzon's India included Pakistan, it included Burma, um, it included Bangladesh, and it required shadow zones of influence in the Middle East, in Central Asia, in um, in, 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 in Southeast Asia, up through the Gulf of Siam. And um, it was sort of an India that was laterally the dominant <coughs> power along the Indian Ocean. And, um, and Curzon, Curzon is increasingly relevant um, when, you, when you talk to Indian elites. Now, let me say this about the, the India-China rivalry. I call it a rivalry, not a conflict is because it has no real difficult history behind it. Uh, Buddhism spread from India to China. India and China are separated by the Himalayas. India and China are two great world civilizations that more or less develop separately from each other and are very different from each other. What's brought India and China into rivalry, why Indian elites talk increasingly nervously about China, is the shrinkage of distance. Um, and it's the shrinkage of distance caused by the rise of military technology. You have now 
uh, Chinese air bases in Tibet with fighter jets whose arc of operations includes India. Um, you have these Chinese built ports that the Indians are especially very nervous about. Uh, what, you know, as a response to Gwadar in Pakistan, the Indians have really enlarged and rebuilt Karwar south of Mumbai, uh, where they're developing you know, a major naval base on the Konkan coast. Um, and so, and you, and you know, in, Indian, Indian Navy sphere of operations overlaps with that of China in the South China Sea. India and China competing with each other in the Seychelles and Mauritius and all these islands um, in the Indian Ocean. This, and with this, this is, you know, this is the rise of new powers, uh, really. Uh, the U.S., first of all, measuring the size of navies is an art, it's not a science. I mean, I mean, I've seen people have arguments arguing basically over gross tonnage, over personnel, over number of warships, over number of missiles on each ship. Um, but basically, the U.S. Navy is far and away the largest navy in the world. But the relative distance between the U.S. Navy and the Chinese and other navies <coughs> is closing. Uh, the U.S. Navy had um, 580 odd warships in the Reagan era. It had about 350 odd warships during the Clinton era. It's down to 286 now. The Congressional Budget Office talks about a 250 ship navy. Um, this is significant. Uh, this is really significant because Nav because naval and air platforms are so expensive, they more or less mirror the health of a national economy. If an economy is wobbly for years into the future, there's going to be political pressure against building ships that cost $5 billion each and fighter jets that can cost $100 million each. Um, and if you have an economy like China's that's growing at 8 10% yearly and its defense budget has been increasing by 10% yearly and over the last 19 years, you're going to see a gradual closure. So this is what I mean. We're, it, we've been in a multipolar economic world since the 90s. We're entering a multipolar military world as well. And where you're going to see this play out in the most interesting fashion is going to be in the Indian Ocean, in the, where you have India, China, U.S. Navy kind of coming together, and, it, and it's a way to kind of discuss how the Middle East interacts with China. Um, finally, let me talk about the South China Sea for a few minutes. Um, I consider the South China Sea part of the greater Indian Ocean. It, it's, um, it's sort of like the antechamber of the Indian Ocean. Um, it's, um, it's in geographical terms, it's called a marginal sea, which means it's half enclosed and half open to the ocean, which is like the Caribbean, is also a marginal sea. And the, 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 um, the South China Sea is incredibly rich in oil and natural gas. Um, it, you know, the bulk of shipping that comes from the Horn of Africa to Japan, Korea, east, the east coast of China goes through the South China Sea. Um, China considers the South China Sea a core interest, and I'll explain what that means in a minute. Um, the Filipinos, the Vietnamese, the Malaysians, the Indonesians oppose that, and the U.S. opposes that. Um, when I brought this up to a Chinese colonel, uh, he gave me a very revealing answer that I've heard and read about in other places. He said, your president, John Quincy Adams, you know, he made this statement about how the Caribbean may technically be an international war waterway, but the Americans hope to dominate it. And he said, you Americans basically considered the Caribbean your own sea, especially after the building of the Panama Canal. Um, Despite the fact that it was an international waterway, why should China think any differently about the South China Sea than American presidents in the, throughout the 19th and early 20th century thought of the Caribbean? Um, so I, I kind of consider the South China Sea China's Caribbean. Um, if China can dominate it in the way that America came to dominate the Caribbean, China will be the great maritime power in East Asia. 
you know, in, sometime in the 21st century. But if the United States and other countries, especially Vietnam, can push back, um, then it won't. And let me just end the talk, as I'm, up, I'm on 30 minutes, with the U.S. and Vietnam. To me, the U.S.-Vietnamese relationship, military relationship I'm talking about, is going to be one of the most important U.S. bilateral relationships in the 21st century. Um, Vietnam needs the United States to balance against China, because Vietnam dominates the whole western South China Sea. Um, Vietnam won a war against the United States, which means it has no chips on its shoulder, no axes to grind, no face to lose by entering into a military alliance with the United States. It can do so without apologizing to any of its neighbors. Um, but of course, the U.S. and Vietnam will not have a formal military alliance. Um, the U.S. will not have a naval base at Cameron Bay. What, uh, because that would be too provocative to China. And the U.S. will be careful not to provoke China um, 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 too much. So the U.S.-Vietnamese relationship may very well evolve like the U.S.-Indian relationship is evolving, as something that's implicit rather than explicit and is strong precisely because it is explicit. I mean that it is implicit. And let me just end with a word on Sri Lanka. Um, a word on Sri Lanka. The Sri Lankan Civil War ended very dramatically and decisively in the spring of 2009. And I would consent, contend that the Chinese essentially won the war. Um, the Chinese supplied the Sri Lankan government with everything from assault rifles to fighter jets, all kinds of training, protected the Sri Lankans you know, diplomatically at a time when the Western powers were withdrawing aid and withdrawing diplomatic support because of human rights violations. Uh, the Chinese are building a big port there. Um, the Sri Lankan government you know, is extremely close to China because of how China helped them win the war. And, but again, just like the U.S. will not provoke China by having a base in Cameron Bay, just like China will not provoke India by having a base in Gwadar, China will not provoke India by not having a full naval base in Sri Lanka. Places like Sri Lanka, Nepal, Bangladesh, where India and China are going to play a very subtle, great game of sorts. And I'll end the talk here. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you. Okay, lots of time for questions. Um, I'll just take the prerogative of the chair by asking the first sure. question. Sure. Yeah. I've had the um, great good fortune to spend some time with Bob in India, as well as the United States over the last year. I've heard him speak. I've read his book, which I think is part strategy, part history, part culture, part geography, which makes it a fascinating book at a region of the world that we certainly need to learn more about. Take the strategy part for a minute and just spin out part of what you talked about. If you are a Chinese strategist, yeah. or a Japanese strategist, right. or an Indian strategist, right. or an American strategist, these are the four countries that will have preponderance of military power yeah. in the next century. Um, how does that balance of power work itself out? And particularly given the fact that three of them are democratic, right. two of them are formally aligned militarily, Japan and the United States. Yeah. India is increasingly not officially aligned but close to the U.S. and Japan. Are we looking <coughs> at a Japan-U.S.-India coalition to limit and manage the rise of China militarily I, in this region? Here's how I would put and it. And will that be the big yeah. issue that we students need to face? All right. Future? Where is President Obama going the day after Election Day? Um, you know, the Republicans will claim that he's running away from his problems. I would claim that he's confronting the new world that will confront the United States post-Iraq, post-Afghanistan. He's going to India, Indonesia, Japan, South Korea, what Nicholas Spikeman, a Yale strategist in the early 1940s, called the, the you know, the Rimland, you know, uh, and, and, you know, which dominated Eurasia and controlled the ins and outs of Eura Eurasia to other parts of the world. And I, you know, and what unites these four places where Obama is going. I would contend it's the rise of China. 
in each place, uh, you know, in, you know how India deals with China, how Indonesia. I mean, I haven't spoken about. Let me say one word about Indonesia. Indonesia has two submarines. The Chinese have about 68. The Chinese are, you know, are encroaching on Indonesian waters in terms of fisheries, um, you know, uh, you know, uh, you know and, and trade. The Indonesians cannot protect their far-flung archipelago. The Indonesians want the United States Navy there as a head, as a balancing hedge against China, because it be precisely because Indonesia's biggest trading partner is China. And Indonesia needs a hedge, but Indonesia cannot say this because it would offend the other parts of the Muslim world if it did. So it can say this behind closed doors to the president, but it can't say he can't say it officially. So what President Obama is doing is he's leveraging like-minded democratic others, um, and at the same time he will be reaching out to China because that's the only responsible thing to do. Um, but he will be leveraging like-minded democratic others to strengthen their own militaries, essentially, and to, you know, and, and, and to strengthen their bilateral relationships with the United States to preserve the balance of power uh, um, in, in, in Eurasia. Um, you know, Spikeman, Spikeman wrote that what made America the greatest power on Earth militarily was the Caribbean. Because it was the domination of the greater Caribbean that allowed America to be dominant in the Western Hemisphere. By the greater Caribbean, he included Colombia, Venezuela, the Guyanas, the whole northern third of South America. Um, um, so by dominating the greater Caribbean, the U.S. dominated the Western Hemisphere and could therefore have room, as he put it, have energy and resources to spare to help determine the balance of power in Eurasia. Um, and I would say that this still holds. Uh, this still holds, though the U.S. is more and more challenged than the Caribbean, though that's a whole other discussion. Um, um, it still holds in this end. How do we preserve the balance of power in, in Eurasia by leveraging the rimland? Uh, you know, to, to kind of Containment's a terrible word because it was the word used during war, during the Cold War, but to essentially put parameters on Chinese expansion. Thank you very much, Professor Sullivan. Thank you for that. I'd like to um, push you to speak a little bit more explicitly about the potential for conflict. I'm sure you're always pushed in this direction. <coughs> But you've talked a lot about how the capabilities of these countries are changing. But when we look at conflict, we always look at the capability and the intent. And so I'm wondering if you could say a few words about the intent of these countries, and especially for those of us who look at China and still see China as um, essentially domestically focused, yeah. um, how is that affecting its external yeah. behavior and its intent? I, I think anyone who says, here's China's grand strategy, doesn't know what they're talking about. Because I don't think the Chinese know what their grand strategy is. The Chinese have very feisty arguments between Chinese think tanks about this. What does China intend at Guadar or Chittagong? I don't think the Chinese have fully determined it. I think the only thing they've determined on the Indian Ocean is they will build roads and pipelines from their port in Burma, across Burma. In, 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 into southern China, into Yunnan province. Uh, but Pakistan, Bangladesh, roads, pipelines, that's for arguments and discussions into the future. I think the Chinese are, 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 are test, testing themselves out. If I had to make a guess, I would think the Chinese don't want to go to war with the U.S. or any country. What they, you know, they're seeking anti-access capability. They're, emphasis, they're putting a lot of money into submarines, ballistic missiles, hitting moving targets at sea, and, moving, and, and GPS satellites in space. What does this all add up to? It, it, it adds up to they want a disposition of forces in the South and East China Seas, in the Indian Ocean, that will be favorable to them so that they never have to fight a war. Um, and, and that means, that ultimately means, and this is where the world gets tricky, this will mean preventing the U.S. Navy 
from going wherever it wants, whenever it wants. And so that the U.S. Navy can no longer consider the, the Western Pacific and American Lake the way that it has since the end of World War II. So that's China. You know, that's China's intent. Um, there's just been a book published by two professors at the Naval War College about India's Monroe Doctrine strategy in the Indian Ocean, uh, James Holmes and Toshi Yoshihara. Um, and um, the, you know, they say because of India's geography, well, let me put it this way. When you talk to the head of the Indian Navy, you get this sense of where everywhere. We're in the Mozambique Channel with our warships. We're in the South China Sea with our warships. We're gonna, we should be the dominant power in the Indian Ocean. We think in big power terms. When you speak to the head of the Indian Army, he's tearing his hair out. Because he's worried about Naxalites and insurgents right inside India. He's worried about movements of population from southern Nepal into Nepal. He's talking about semi-failed states, not just in Pakistan, but all around India. So India has great ambitions, but it's bedeviled by its difficult land borders with semi-failed states, which take up so much energy. Uh, from the Indian elite, and it, it's the taking up of this energy that makes it hard, harder, I would say, for, Indi for Indians, you know, to focus outward. Uh, in other words, the, 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 the naval chief is in a totally different strategic world than the army chief, um, and this shows a lot, you know, about, about India. I think Japan, um, um, you know, the U.S. Japanese relations over the past year have been more fascinating than I think in the previous 40 or 50 years. And they've gotten, it's been well covered in the news pages of the Wall Street Journal, but not well covered in the New York Times, I would argue. Um, Japan finally got a post-World War II government. Um, and, and lo and behold, it wanted to create some distance between the United States and Japan. And to the Obama administration's credit, it did not go ballistic. It did not really issue threats. It was very, it, it was very tough behind the scenes, but very careful about the rhetoric. And then, lo and behold, the Chinese and the Japanese got into this argument about the Senkaku Islands in the Sea of Japan, I believe, and. You know, and the, and the North Korean sinking of the South Korean warship, which the Chinese would not issue an apology uh, for. And suddenly the Japanese realized, you know, the, relate, the military alliance with the U.S. is there, not just because we've had the same party in power for 40 years. It's because we need it. And so I, I think U.S.-Japanese relationship is going to come back on a very healthy keel. And I think... What, you know, Japan, Japan knows that its economy is going to be dependent on China in the 21st century. And precisely because of that, it needs to balance. You know, it, it needs the U.S. Navy's presence. It's very strong in the region. Um, let me just close up with an answer to your question with a great article that was published in an Australian journal called Quarterly Essay. And it was written by a, 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 an analyst named Yu White. And, he's, and you know, he kind of summarized the whole East Asian strategic situation. He said, Australia has had a great gig going for the last 40 or 50 years. We've had the US Navy essentially the unipolar power, which is the most stable power. You know, power. And, we've had, and because the US is, is basically organized this strategic military sphere. It's left us and every other country in the region to develop our economies so that China's rising. We have all these new customers in China and elsewhere. It's been a very benign strategic environment for Australia. Um, but now we said that's all changing. It's, it's changing because the, as China rises militarily in, you know, in East Asia, so I think Australia, Japan, Malaysia, Indonesia are all more nervous than they've ever been. That's very good. Um, Ambassador Jawad is here. Where does Afghanistan fit in this mosaic? Now, you might want to say a few words, but I, I, there's a conversation between the two of you about 
about the future of this country, of this country, in this wider, in this wider region. Yeah, uh, thank you very much. Yes, uh, not, not only the, the, the position of Afghanistan in that wider region, but also the India-Pakistan rivalry has a lot of implications for uh, regional stability and global security. Uh, India might not see it as significant as, as Pakistan see it from their side, that rivalry with it. So uh, how significant is for India as a regional power also to look, to look uh, at the north? And, 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 be, and we see also an expansion of, of the presence and, and the influence of, of China and, and the former uh, Soviet Republic, Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, Turkmenistan, and other. Uh, with, with, with India, is this something that will be of consideration for India on rank? Would, and especially with the, with the increased close relation between India and the United States, could yeah. India play a role on stabilizing uh, and, and, and dealing with some of the concern or the phobia that exists in Pakistan? You know, uh, people who cover India in the U.S. are now looking for the next big thing. You know, beyond the civil nuke deal, what's next to keep the relationship on the up and up. And I would argue that, yeah, that's something to consider, but there's something else that Americans, this administration, are, have trouble with, which is Afghanistan. Um, the, the United, if, you know, President Obama has said he wants to leave Afghanistan. You know, he signaled that he would like to leave Afghanistan, conditions permitting. And the Indians have sort of signaled that's precisely what we're afraid of, that you'll leave Afghanistan. Um, because India is more invested in the Karzai government and in Afghanistan than the Americans are. Because if you read Indian history, going all the way back to antiquity, from the Harappans all the way to the Mughals, Afghanistan isn't some distant place in Central Asia. It's almost part of the subcontinent. It's kind of in the neighborhood of the subcontinent. There have been many dynasties throughout history um, that have included the eastern half of Afghanistan, all of Pakistan, and the, north, and the northern third of India. Um, and India requires a more or less stable, more or less secular, more or less non-fundamentalist, non-controlled by Pakistan and Afghanistan. Um, you know, that's what India requires. Um, and if the United States were to withdraw precipitously from Afghanistan, and the key word is precipitously, um, it might put that in danger. So I think one of the things we have to consider when you read the op-eds, like we have to get out of Afghanistan today, now, and you know, all these writers are culminating, is that, all right, but one thing to consider is, if the United States were ever really to cut and run from Afghanistan, and a Taliban regime were to take over, I, the Indian elite would lose a lot of respect for the United States, I would argue. Uh, it, it, and, and that would cause India, and you know, and this is actually Talos' argument, it would cause India to hedge in the direction of Iran, in the direction of Russia, in the direction of China even. Um, and, and, and so Afghan, Afghanistan, in other words, when you Every place affects every other place, you know, in this organic continuum across, you know, across Eurasia. If Afghanistan can be stabilized, suddenly you have a nexus of roads and pipeline routes that connect up to the Indian Ocean, uh, uh, you know, and connect from Turkmenistan all the way to the Indian Ocean, um, um, you know, where the land silk route meet, meets the maritime silk route. So, yes, the United States should leave Afghanistan as soon as possible, conditions permitting. Which I assume in your judgment is a very long time <laughs> in the future. Um, I think we're going to have several, you know, 30, pick a number, 30, 40, 50,000 U.S. troops in both Afghanistan and Iraq for the next decade. Okay. Yes, Vilas. I'd like to... Uh, hey, let's, uh, please state your name when you ask a question. Sure. Uh, my name is Vilas Rao. I'm a student here at the Kennedy yeah. School. Yeah, I got the emails. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, thanks for coming, first yeah. of all. Um, I want to go back to a point you just made, uh, that in this new world of Asian integration, everything affects everything else. Um, and you mentioned how the rise of uh, significance in the Indian Ocean affects U.S. military policy, specifically with regards to its Navy. 
but it seems to me that it really complicates U.S. diplomacy in Asia, uh, particularly, for example, um, in our partnership with India, or in our, our aspiring partnership with India, and how that affects our relationship with Iran, how it affects yeah. our relationship yeah. with Burma, both of which India has historical, cultural ties with, and right. uh, economic now right. uh, potential yeah. for. So I was wondering, what yeah. opportunities does this new world have, yeah. and what challenges? Um, you know, Iran India is fascinating because it shows how the Middle <coughs> East is connected to South Asia, how there's really nothing apart. You know, if you, there's this great work of two volume work of history by this professor at the University of Wisconsin, Andre Wink Al Hind, uh, about, you know, all the, you know, the, the movements of Middle Eastern peoples into, into the Indian subcontinent over the years. India has Shiite Muslims. You know, it, it, it looks forward to buying natural gas from Iran. Um, you know, its merchants are more and more active in Iran. India requires Iran as a hedge against Pakistan in Afghanistan. It's why India is helping to fund roads in southwestern Nimruz province in Afghanistan that lead to, to Iran so that Afghanistan is less dependent on Pakistan. Um, the I, you know, India's self, national self-interest for geographical reasons is tied up with some sort of close relationship with Iran. Um, and yes, I India, like a lot of people, probably doesn't care for this regime in Iran, but it has real interest there, and that leads me to Burma, because Burma has probably one of the worst military regimes in the world. But that has not stopped democratic India from giving significant military aid to Burma, from trading with Burma, from having joint military exercises with Burma. Why? Because India is simply not in a position to stand aside and watch China make a de facto satellite of sorts out of Burma. And, and, this, and this is very useful to the Burmese regime. because. Even as the Burmese regime may be North Korean trending, it's still like North Korea doesn't want to be too dominated by China. Because if it's too dominated by China, then China can remove its leadership uh, when it wants. So the, so the Burmese are, are both completely dependent and paranoid about China at the same time, and therefore require India as a hedge. And also, I think the U.S., rather than berate India for its dealings with Burma, should actually be grateful. Because, in a sense, let the U.S. stand a half a world away on moral ceremony and, you know, and deride the Burmese regime. Meanwhile, the, by having India involved in Burma, it provides us with an access point in there. Because India, at the end of the day, is democratic. At the, the end of the day, has values closer to the United States than China has. So it's it, you know, it, it, and and at the end of the day, what if this military regime in Burma doesn't collapse soon? What if it just finds a way to go on and on and on? Then it would be very useful to have Indian influence in Burma. I would argue. Yes, sir. Uh, sir, I'm Brendan Mills, I'm a student here at the Kennedy School, and I wanted to ask you, um, with the U.S. Navy. Lot of questions about what kind of ships. Yeah. Um, there's a huge problem in the Navy that you talked about how our sh number of ships that we have is decreasing, but at the same time, it's made a commitment to building carriers through 2050 and sustaining its carrier yeah. power projection yeah. for a very long time. And there's a huge argument within the Navy about yeah. what kind of ships it should build, especially with China yeah. building submarines and so on. So I'm yeah. wondering, what do you think the Navy, the U.S. Navy, should look like in the next 50 years going forward to meet those? All right. The one good thing about carriers is. You only fund one carrier at a time, which means you're not liable to make a mega mistake. You're not liable to like build 10 new carriers and then find out that carriers are not as useful anymore. You know, you'll get it wrong by one or two carriers at the most, but not by eight or 10. The latest carrier, the Ford class, is $12 billion is what it's going to cost um, for one. Minus, minus yeah, minus Without the airplanes on it. That just gives you the, um, you know, you know, that's that's without the planes on it. Um, yeah, the British approach. Yeah, yeah. I was at a, at a breakfast meeting with the Chinese ambassador about two years ago, 
And the ambassador said, why are you Americans so worried about, what, about our Navy? It's not like we're building a carrier or anything. And then somebody next to me who knew a lot more about this stuff than I did said, Mr. Ambassador, with all due respect, I wish you were building carriers <laughs> compared to what you really are built, um, which are submarines. Um, <coughs> carriers can be used in humanitarian intervention because they can pump hundreds of millions of gallons of fresh water onto land, uh, which is what you need in any great natural catastrophe. Carriers can show the flag. Um, you know, they can transport planes. They can do a wide variety of things. They're a national prestige item. Where submarines are all about offensive warfare. Um, it's, uh, you know, this, uh, the, it's a reason why submarine commanders tend to be more militaristic than than, 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 than am I right? Exactly. Yeah, than, than, um, <laughs> than, than, than surface commanders. Um, because they have all this, the U.S. submarine force basically fought a close to hot war against the Soviets throughout the Cold War, and the U.S. submarine force has been essentially battling China for ten years already. If you look at where the deployments are, if you look at the exercises, I mean, you know, it's not a question anymore about China if you're a submarine commander. Um, China is investing heavily in submarines. Um, um, I would say carriers are still going to be useful because, and the reason is we're going to have, I think, more and more humanitarian catastrophes because in absolute terms, we have more and more urban uh, populations living in fragile uh, environmentally and seismic areas. Um, so, that, so, so, that, um, the, it, so that the number of human beings who are going to be killed or made homeless by Mother Nature is going to go up significantly over the next 20 or 30 years. And we saw during the Indonesian tsunami how if you can take the lead in a humanitarian emergency, that gives you real strategic throwaway because that opened up doors to the Indonesian military that the U.S. didn't have for the previous 15 years. I mean, there were some real hard power benefit repercussions to, um, to, the, you know, to, that, to that relief effort. Um, so I, I, I wouldn't, comp the problem with carriers is that the, 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 um, the trend is in the direction of offensive weapons, of, be of missiles that can hit carriers, of hit moving targets at sea, so that it's going to become easier and easier to hit surface vessels as the years go along, which is why the future of naval warfare is probably underwater. Um, which is why the Chinese are, you know, are making the right investments, essentially. Matt? Yeah, Matt Rayfin, a student here as well. Um, just on the humanitarian point, because I think that's an excellent point. Um, what is the downside to China's investment in submarines? Um, and getting to that, the U.S. was the first, obviously on the stage um, in Haiti, uh, well, we the first group on over. Uh, great investment there, but also in the tsunami situation, many humanitarian <coughs> disasters around the world. We have MEUs, I believe, in the Marines that yeah. can deploy yeah. in the Atlantic and the Pacific. Is the advantage to that that we get all these hard power um, benefits? And then, if that's the case, what does China lose out by investing in this attack yeah. thing? And how well, does it, how's it balance? Yeah, well, there's a dis China now, it appears, is building one or two sub uh, aircraft carriers or acquiring old Russian carriers. And apparently the tsunami had a big effect on the Chinese Navy because they felt humiliated. Um, they couldn't help out. And, they, and for a national prestige item, um, uh, combined with the results of the tsunami rescue operation, the Chinese are going to have one or two carriers. Um, but again, that's not what the U.S. is really worried about. Or right? it's not really what the Indians are really worried about uh, when it comes to the Chinese Navy. Um, but China's calculations are, I think that, I think they learned from the tsunami. You know that you know they they saw that it brought the U.S. Navy in a big way into the Indonesian archipelago, where it really hadn't been for many years before, because we were frozen out because of Congress and you know there were human rights questions with the Indonesian military because of the war. Um, 
But I think China itself is hedging its bets in this regard. You think they'll engage more in humanitarian? They're going to try. Okay. They're going to try. Yeah. There's another aspect of this. I mean, yeah. If you look at the tsunami, it's a very interesting kind of case study. You had Japan, India, Australia, and the United States coalesce militarily ahead of the UN's capacity to go into the effective areas and rush relief support. China may not have had the military capacity. I would argue didn't even have the inclination to think this was China's responsibility yeah. in a political sense. And so if it has the capacity, it also has to have the political framework or political will to think that it's part of its own responsibility as a great power yeah. to give up some of that power in situations like that. That was interesting to me about the Chinese, the lack of Chinese response, both parts of the answer, yeah. not just one. Yeah. There's a question back here. No questions back here. No comments back here. Okay. <laughs> yes, sir. Tim Watson, uh, National Security Fellow. Last well, heard you talk. Are uh, you from which branch? Uh, Army. Army. Okay. okay. So I guess we're, we're losing out on this, except for being in Afghanistan and Iraq from eternity. <laughs> Last heard you talk at, uh, you came to visit Sam's and talk about yeah, war, war yeah. politics yeah. several years ago. And usually you write a book to generate a response. So given this huge stakes, uh, economic, critical area, uh, these at-risk populations we talked about, layers of sediment of civilizations that evolved, moved through their uh, Hindu, Confucian, Islamic culture, and there's this great game of risk going on where people are trying to isolate each other, China isolating India, U.S. pulling coalitions. The PLA, uh, hard to say, are, are they independent of the government? Because some of the statements they make are not what I think the Chinese diplomats can have to say. So how does the U.S. respond to that? What, what is our regional strategy? We're not really set up for it. Foreign state, or I think that we're still struggling with the regional approaches, vice the, the country centric approaches, and take on where it is isn't really positioned to, to deal with the Indian Ocean. So, your, your thoughts on the yeah. grand strategy yeah. for um, the Indian Ocean? You know, can I just repeat yeah, for sure. those of you who may not have heard the yeah. question? Yeah. Um, from a U.S. Army officer, essentially, what is the grand strategy? for the Indian Ocean in the future from an American perspective or from, America. from an American perspective? Kind of All a variation right. of the question I asked. Um, yeah. Let me just go back to what you said initially. Um, it, there's a debate going on in Washington about whether the PLA, the People's Liberation Army, and the plan, as it's called, the People's Liberation Army Navy, I love that acronym, you know, uh, that, you know about is the plan gaining military power in you know, in, in gaining political power in decision-making circles in China. in China, because because this you know taking a tough stance along with North Korea, uh, this dispute with Japan, this stating the South China Sea is a core interest. You know, some people in Washington say the only thing that can explain this is that China is building a great navy, has been for years, and it's logical that after a time that, you know, the military would gain more power in decision-making circles, and that's what we're seeing. Uh, that's the only thing that explains, you know, some of the things the Chinese are doing, because up until a few months ago, they were really at pains to show we're not like the Americans, we're not hegemonic, we're, we're benevolent, we don't invade countries, we don't make arch statements, uh, you know, things like. But suddenly they've scared the daylights out of Japan. They, you know, they, they you know, and they've scared people in the region. You know, they've scared South Korea. And um, do we have a grand strategy? Um, maybe Megan is best suited to answer that, having worked at, at, you know, having worked at extremely high levels in the White House. Um, the only thing that's demonstrable to me is as, as I used this phrase earlier, is we are, we're doing several things. And, and you know, both the, 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 uh, the Bush and Obama White Houses have been leveraging like-minded democratic others in the region. And I think that the appointment of the special envoys to Israel, Palestine, Afghanistan, Pakistan has had one unnoted about side effect which is it's freed up the Secretary of State's time 
to make repeated trips to East Asia. And, and I, mean, we, I mean, Secretary Clinton, what's she been doing the past two years with her public diplomacy? I would say, though she can never say this publicly, she's competing with China, um, you know, in most of the places where she's gone. Uh, all right, she made one trip to the Balkans. That was about something else, you know. But basically, if you you know, two thirds of her trips abroad have been, in one sense or another, competing with China. Um, do you want to? Say? I, I actually, rather than take the the floor from yeah. you, I'd rather put it back to you. Okay. Um, about half of my <laughs> geopolitics of energy, or two thirds of my geopolitics of energy class, um, is here. And they're very shy, so I'm wondering. Um, yeah, I'll call on them. Yeah. Actually, I, I think Dan has his hand up. Uh, yeah. Maybe actually, I'll defer to you, Dan, if you've got an energy-related question. It's not energy-related. Actually, I'm letting you down. Uh, I'll still let you get to Dan, but I wondered if you might say just a little bit more explicitly about the energy piece because I think it's right. underlaid everything yeah. you said. Yeah. Right. Yeah, um, it is. But if you could maybe tease right. it out a, a little right. bit more. Right. All right. Here, here's how I would tease it out. It's that between now and 2030 there's going to be a 45% rise in the consumption of hydrocarbons in the world. And half of that's going to come from India and China. And most of that is going to come from the greater Middle East, which means uh, the Indian Ocean is going to become a crowded interstate, energy, you know, global energy interstate. The China, you know, what motivates American foreign policy under both, de under both Democrats and Republicans? It's spreading civil society around. What motivates Chinese foreign policy? Hydrocarbons. Getting hydrocarbons, strategic minerals, and strategic metals. Um, so what is China, you know, what are all these Indian Ocean ports about? What are the pipelines to Kazakhstan for, you know, for oil from Turkmenistan across Uzbekistan to Western China, natural gas? Um, China is looking for as many ways as it can find to alleviate pressure on the Strait of Malacca. Um, because it's, get, it's just too dependent on the Strait of Malacca for, for, you know, for, uh, for energy. And this is a big issue for China because, Ch you know, if you're the Chinese party secretary, you've got the responsibility to raise the standard of living significantly of a fifth of humanity. And that can only no really, and 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 that can only be done with a lot of oil and natural gas and strategic metals and minerals. I mean, the U.S. is saying, how can we leave Afghanistan? It's the Chinese are saying, how can we stay in Afghanistan? How can we move into Afghanistan? Because there's a trillion dollars worth of minerals up there. We're 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 already prospecting for copper there. Um, so uh, you know, China would like it fine. If the U. This is where where China and India's uh, goals come together. They both they both would like the U.S. to stabilize Afghanistan and Pakistan. China would have a caveat, I would say, as long as the U.S. does it very slowly, because we we like to see the U.S. bleed and distract it away from East Asia at the same time. But I, you know, I I, I think um, there. There's more. There's going to be more and more energy traffic from Saudi Arabia, from Iran, from from Sudan, from Ethiopia, from Somalia, Ethiopia, which have significant natural oil and natural gas deposits, to you know, to China and, and to India in coming years. So, in addition to saying the U.S. will stay, because you predicted at least ten years, I think it will probably be twenty or thirty. Yeah. U.S. military presence in Afghanistan. Should we stay? For strategic reasons, should we want to be there for strategic reasons of the type that you've described? Here, here's the problem, and this is why this is being this argued about it endlessly. It's once you've been in a place for a lengthy period of time, you develop equities, uh, you know, that you may not have originally had, and the U.S. can't just turn, you know, turn off Afghanistan, you know, like a switch or something. Uh, um, Plagiarizing Henry Kissinger said that, uh, you know, um, but I, the, I, I think we need to find a way to get down from a hundred thousand troops to fifty thousand troops, and to cut the cost from a trillion dollars a year to half that. Answer the question. You have a you have question back, yeah. back here, and then run out. 
Uh, yes, sir. Uh, Dan Connell, uh, MTA program. Yeah. Question for you before. I know one of the things that we use to frame this a lot is the capability versus intent. And obviously, there's the intent to make themselves a make the Chinese a power in the Indian Ocean, but the capability not only in terms of the hardware, but the actual practice of blue water operations. Right. Yeah. It's a very new development for the Chinese. I mean, they've been historically a brown water navy. Right. So yeah. I mean, I guess my question to you would be, how do you how do you foresee that progress unfolding? Because obviously yeah. that's going to be a fairly lengthy process for them, I would imagine, in terms of developing a, a truly a truly blue water navy. Yeah. A great uh, education for me is I spent a month embedded on a destroyer and then another month embedded on a submarine. And the thing that impressed me the most, that what stu stuck out more than anything in those experiences, I would say seamanship. All the things that have to be, I mean a carrier is not just a carrier, a carrier is useless without two destroyers, a frigate, a cruiser, a submarine accompanying it. And how do those ships communicate with each other? How do you do underway, underway replenishment where you, know, you have two moving ships moving at fast speed, high speeds on the blue water and you're transferring oil from one ship to the other? This takes years for a Navy to develop this. So it's not just a matter of buying hardware and being able to afford hardware. You know, brown water refers, of course, to coastal waters. Um, China's had basically not so much a navy in the past, but like many nations, a coast guard. Um, the U.S. Coast Guard is the ninth largest navy in the world. Uh, you know, most, most navies are coast guards. They're not real navies. Um, China wants to build a real navy. And, and as you said, you know, that is going to take, that takes, that takes decades um, to really develop the, you know, the, the blue water seamanship to run all these systems um, well. Thank you. Right uh, Veronica Desai, I am a joint degree here at the Kennedy School and the law school also. Um, I wanted to ask you about, I mean, the, the issue of the rise of China and India is obviously been one that's very popular and you know, has taken the attention of analysts all over the world for, for you know, a very long time. And from what I can tell, I think the U.S. seems a lot more comfortable with the rise of India than the rise of China, obviously. I mean, Rich Pari makes this point. The CNAS report that just came out, I think, explicitly says that India's rise is in the U.S. interest. Yeah. You endorsed that report. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. The, the question I wanted to ask is that report and others always talk about China and India being, you know, we have to make them responsible stakeholders in the global that's yeah. sort of the refrain that you sure. hear over and over. And I think a challenge that policymakers are facing is that for you to make them do that, in their perspective, means arresting their own great rise. Um, from a maritime perspective, you know, obviously U.S. Indian naval cooperation is increasing. And, and you know, the New York Times even yesterday said the Obama administration is now soliciting partners for a coalition against China because they're realizing China is not as flexible as they thought on certain issues. How does one make that? make these countries, or make China specifically, a global stakeholder from a maritime perspective that doesn't at the same time make, you know, essentially ignite old balancing and power games happen in the Indian Ocean region? I think the most effective tool is military to military <coughs> relationships. It's the U.S. military and Navy reaching out to the Chinese military and Navy. And Secretary Gates has tried this. Um, Rumsfeld was very big on this. Um, Admiral Fallon, when he was the head of uh, Pacific Command, really reached out to the Chinese uh, military. The Chinese have not been as forthcoming. They've been a, a bit more closed you know, in, in wanting to engage us. Here's this, a real problem. If there's one issue where the U.S. and Chinese militaries, particularly their armies, should be cooperating and talking to each other. It's about what happens if North Korea collapses. Uh, what you know? What, how? What is the modus vivendi here? Is, is the People's Liberation Army going to cross the Yalu River and set up a, a buffer zone to keep millions of North Koreans from rushing across into China? I mean, if the U.S. Ca you know captures or lands special forces troops. Uh, by North Korean WMD facilities, is China going to consider that a destabilizing operation? Because for what we consider stabilizing, the Chinese may consider destabilizing. And, and we've tried, but the Chinese are not, a, a, don't want to talk to us about it. And you can understand their point of view. Because their point of view is, as one 
State Department diplomat told me, we leak like sieves. And if word ever got out of such talks that China was openly talking with the United States about the collapse of North Korea, what would that do to China's influence in North Korea and relationships in, in, in North Korea? So the Chinese are really in a bind in this um, here. But um, it's something, you know, I, I, I think that some, in this world, a regime like North Korea's is not ultimately viable. And if it's not ultimately viable, it's going to bring the People's Liberation Army and the, Chi and the U.S. Army especially <coughs> close together on land in Asia. And people are going to have to start talking. Time for two more questions. Um, you mentioned uh, Japan with China several times. At the same time, you mentioned uh, Japan's economic future being in China. How do you see them resolving their tensions? And if they do resolve their tensions, how does Japan balance its Chinese and U.S. relationship? Um, that, that's a tough question. Um, Japan's never going to resolve this question, I don't think. It's going to be forced to lean on the United States military uh, 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 to balance again balance against China, even as Japan's biggest trading partner will be China at the same time. Um, Japan would probably like to see an economic recovery of Russia in the Soviet, in the Russian Far East around Vladivostok and the, the Osuria and Amuria River areas, because um, the Russian Far East should have developed in the same dynamic way as the rest of the Pacific Rim in the 70s and 80s, but it didn't because of Soviet communism. Um, um, if, if the Russian Far East were to develop economically, this would, this would complicate the situation and would be helpful to Japan as a way to balance against China. Because this is important. Um, Putin just inaugurated a highway. A, a long highway across this Russian Far East along the border with China. At the same time that he opened the natural gas pipeline from Russia to China, <coughs> what's all this about? It's about the need to sell gas to China but fear of China at the same time. Uh, why does Russia fear China? Because China has a population density 62 times greater on its side of the border than Russia has on its side. Probably the most helpful thing for Japan would, would be, you know, the economic development and free market development of the Russian Far East. Uh, or else, you know, also another thing Japan has to worry about is a greater Korea. Because if you had a reunified Korea, it would inherently be anti-Japanese. Because uh, Japan occupied the whole Korean Peninsula from 1910 to 1945, not just during um, and, you know, and South Korea, is, you know, fears China, but it, it, there's, a, there's a kind of pan-Korean nationalism that would, be, that would probably rise in the event of a united Korea that would be more inherently anti-Japanese than anti-Chinese, I think. Okay, Jade. Yeah. Uh, uh, my name is Jade. I'm Dojan. I'm one of the Sullivan students. Um, I have two questions. First question uh, has to do with uh, I'm not in the military and I feel like a self-fulfilling prophecy scenario might be happening with China and I'm worried about it a little bit because I feel that you've been talk talking about the containment of China and you said at some point if anyone sa knows, thinks or says that he knows how China is operating, they don't know what they're talking about. So basically Chinese, if they're confused or if they're not yet clear-minded about a specific vision, there's a, a big range of ways in which China can develop. That's basically what you're saying. Yeah, yeah. And we might actually be directly or indirectly pushing China in one direction or the other. Yeah. So to what ex my first question is, to what extent is our hedging tactic that is subtle or unsubtle uh, pushing China in a specific direction? Can I take that question first? And Should I do it afterwards? Ask a second. All right. Yeah, yeah right. Um, <laughs> you know, that's, 
that's obviously the art of diplomacy and strategy. How not to create a self, how to hedge without making it a self-fulfilling expectation. That's why I said, you know, you contain China through leveraging like-minded democratic others, but at the same time you reach out to China wherever you can, but it's been hard. It's just been very difficult, particularly Secretary Gates has put a lot of energy into reestablishing military to military relationships with China, but he hasn't gotten very far uh, so far. But he, you know, he keeps at this, and he's very worried about it. Um, if I were to like um, be a, a, a Monday morning quarterback and just add one little criticism of Secretary Clinton's recent travels is. One of the reasons why China got so upset about her declaration about mediating disputes in the South China Sea, um, and you know the Chinese really went ballistic on this, is she said it from Hanoi. She said it from Vietnam. Had she said it at the Council of Foreign Relations in New York, it wouldn't have had the same impact, I don't think. Um, so, you, you know, more care can be taken about you know such statements because. Saying it in Vietnam was very, um, very provocative, you know, from a Chinese point of view. Uh, and the second question? Yeah. Uh, just one small thing on what the first question, and maybe we should also worry about the public diplomacy part, because of the rising amount of middle class in China and the impact they're going to eventually have on politics. How much maybe we should also be wary, not only what the party thinks, but what the growing middle class right. think in yeah. China and how they're going to affect Chinese politics. Yeah. That's one. Second question is about. Iran and China. Uh, if I look at the map, we, the Indian Ocean, as you were saying, is a completely controlled by India and the states, the Navy. To a certain extent, India, uh, China, whatever it does, it will never be able to kind of control or compete on the securing of those maritime lines between Africa and the Middle East, where this energy is coming from, and the China. So it's, if it wants a certain independence, it's going to have to look for it some, from a, through another canal than the Indian Ocean, because there it's practically lost hope. And then I start thinking of pipelines uh, through Afghanistan and Iran, and that starts making me think that maybe the relationship between China and Iran is more strategic than I thought till now. And it's not only about, uh, you know, whatever uh, reaction to the states, but maybe China needs to secure a very solid ground link to the Middle East through Afghanistan or Pakistan and Iran to get to the Persian Gulf, yeah. because it can't control the Indian Ocean. Yeah. That's what China is hoping to do, but the problem is Afghanistan. Uh, that's one of the problems. It would like to have you know roads and pipelines through Afghanistan. Uh, it, um, if it can't, it'll connect through Turkmenistan and then you know through Central Asia into China. You know, if you look at a map of the eighth century Tang Dynasty in China, you would see not Chinese total control, but Chinese sphere of influence all the way into Khorasan in northeastern Iran. Um, China, China, Chinese know their history. You know? Uh, you know, this whole area of, you know, of routes into Central Asia, and remember about Iran, that's sometimes forgotten in, in, in America, is that Iran is a Central Asian country as much as it's a Middle Eastern uh, uh, country. It fronts on the Caspian as well as the Persian Gulf. Um, uh, it's, um, you know, it, it, the border between Iran and Turkmenistan is, is it's a flat border. There are no. It's not a mountain. It's difficult to cross border. Um, so Iran is go and Iran has been busy initiating roads into Central Asia. President Ahmadinejad has been flying around Central Asia. Um, we, it, this doesn't get covered very much in the American press. We're totally focused on what he does in the Middle East. Um, but um, the linkage. One of the reasons why Iran is so critical is that it fronts both the Caspian and the Persian Gulf and, and Mesopotamia and Central Asia all at the same time. And in a Chinese Central Asian strategy would have to include Iran in terms of an energy strategy. I want to thank um, Robert Kaplan for a very stimulating hour and 20 minutes. Great presentation. Thank you. Thank you for being at Harvard. Good luck with your book. Thank you. And we hope to see you back here.